All right, hello and welcome to the Expert Insights interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Velton Shawell, who is in Florida. How are you doing, Velton? I'm doing fantastic, but I'm not doing as well as you are. <laughs> well, we'll see about that by the end of the interview. <laughs> um, so Velton uh, is a nationally recognized speaker, trainer. He's a published author. He's a business consultant. Uh, he speaks, teaches, trains all over the, uh, the U United States and abroad. And, and so, Velton, you really help people achieve higher levels of success. And leadership is one of the things that you talk about. So well, what I wanted to talk to you uh, today about the concept of dynamic leadership and what mm -hmm. dynamic leadership actually means. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, dynamic leadership is pretty much what it says. Leadership is a, can be a very detailed situation and it can be very intricate at times. Mm -hmm. But developing a leadership style is important to your success. And that is a conglomeration of a lot of different things that you learn from a lot of different people. And I was fortunate in my career that I was able to work with a lot of people that I would label geniuses in their own right. And they taught me a lot of great concepts and ideas about leadership that I was able to utilize in my career and I still utilize today. So what, what, were, what were some of the common traits or strategies that these um, leaders uh, use that you could identify? Well, there are a lot of different things. One is leaders are environmentalists. And I, I really believe that. It's your responsibility to create an environment for success. So it's not just about you as an individual doing things, but you doing things individually but also with your team members that creates an energy level, creates and motivates them to be the best that they can be, and finally creates an environment that it's a, you are celebrated, not tolerated. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, uh, let's dig into that point a little bit because in a lot of organizations, people let the environment uh, happen organically or by accident or it just, or the environment in one department may be very different from the environment in another department because there's no uh, established environment or culture. So, um, you know, how, do, how do you go about really ensuring that you take a holistic approach? Well, first and foremost, I'm a firm believer in the number one asset in any organization are the people and the, the, the people inside of the organization, the culture, the environment, um, the attitude, and the camaraderie and teamwork and collaboration. You know, you can only go so far as an individual. And one of my favorite uh, coaches was uh, Phil Jackson. And mm -hmm. I'll take you back to the days with the Chicago Bulls when Michael Jordan and Scottie mm -hmm. Pippen and those guys were playing. And Phil had a concept that I, I believe in to this day, and I, I love what he said. He said, Good teams become great when the players trust each other enough to replace me with we. And when you can create an environment like that in your operation, people start to go over and above, not based on what's in it for them, but how far they collectively can go and what, what, role, what heights they can achieve as a unit. So talk to me a little bit about um, uh, how do you get, how do you build those levels of trust? Because obviously, I mean, that's key to it. Uh, if you're going to go from me to we is the trust. And as you said, say with the Chicago mm -hmm. Bulls, the, the level of trust that uh, they all had in each other. And let's face it, I mean, the Chicago Bulls, they had Michael Jordan, you know, the greatest basketball player of all time. But uh, they still managed to build a team where the constituent parts were greater than mm -hmm. just one single star. Well, here, the first thing is, and this is somewhat attributable, you get the right people on the bus, you get the wrong people off the bus. Mm -hmm. There are some people that you're going to have to, I hate to say it, but love from a distance just because they don't fit the role for the betterment of the team. And that's okay. 
You're going to have people that are misplaced. There may be a person who may not be achieving great heights, but they may, may be misplaced, miscategorized, or misguided. So if you as the leader can find the key to that individual, you can turn a average performer into a superstar. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a for instance. If you have someone who is, I've kind of had it in the past, a technician, they're, they're very strategic, they're very methodical, they're very detail-oriented. And we're talking about sales. I was a director of sales and marketing for 20 years. This person was so regimented in detail that it got in the way of their productivity as a salesperson. We took that person out of their sales role and put them into a more service-oriented role. And they became the manager of the quarter within six months. Why? Because their role on the team was misplaced. Mm -hmm. It was miscategorized. So in that particular instance, that's what happens when you're building a team. That's why it's important to understand the dynamics of the people and the roles that you're asking them to play in the organization. Yeah, and I think that's a real critical point there, Velton, because we, we agree with you 100%, is that uh, a lot of the time people seem so obsessed with going, you know, they do their performance review and they say, yeah, this is all great, but here's the one thing that you don't really do well, and I'm going to focus all my time and energy on this thing, instead of saying, well, I'm better off focusing you in a role and maximizing your strengths than because I'm never, uh, you know, I'm probably never going to fix this anyway. And I can get so much more out of uh, focusing on your strengths and having you in the right place. Well, you know, it's the difference between being a, what I would call a coach and a police officer. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number one, a performance evaluation should never be a surprise. It's something that should happen on a regular basis and not in a adversarial way, but in a conversational way. If you understand and identify that a person has a shortcoming in an area, as their leader, it's your responsibility to try to help them fix it. And if they can't understand it, but one of the other things that I learned very early in my career, and I, I was told this, it takes three strokes for every poke. For every time you poke somebody as a leader, it takes three times as much energy to build that person back up mm -hmm. so that they feel good about themselves. So when you're leading or you're managing somebody, understand there are going to be times where you're going to have to reprimand them. But if you keep them uplifted enough, the one or two times that you got to poke them in the gut, it doesn't hurt as much and it doesn't hurt as long because they know you have their best interest. In. Yeah, that, I think that's a really good point and a great takeaway for everybody here. And just going back to one thing you mentioned earlier about putting people in the right roles and, and if they're not the right roles, either you find the role that is the right role or maybe they need to. What was your phrase? Uh, love, love them from a distance? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that one. Um, Here's what I often see happen is, is that people build the role according to the people they have rather than build the role according to what is best needed for the organization or whatever. And, the, and, then, um, and so then you end up with building, building roles around people that don't suit those roles. And it all gets messed up as opposed to building the role and then seeing, do I have the people? And if not, then I have to find the right people. Or I've got to move the people around. But it's going to take people out of the equation first and then put them back in later. Well, you know, as a leader, your first responsibility is to create the vision. Mm -hmm. And if you're creating a vision or if you have a vision, then the people are the instruments that allow you to fulfill or to make the music of that vision. So you're creating the vision and then you are surrounding yourself with the right people. You know, if you want to be a genius, the best way to be a genius is what? Surround yourself with geniuses. Because even if you're not at that level yet, they'll pull you up there eventually and you will get to the genius level yourself. But if you 
surround yourself with people that are beneath your level or at the same level, it's harder for you to climb. You may eventually climb, but the re- projection is going to be somewhat flat. Mm -hmm. And the amount of time that it's going to take you to get there is going to be much, much more limited. You know, Steve Jobs said something. He said, we hire great people not to tell them what to do, but for them to tell us how to get it done. Mm -hmm. So when you're staffing your organization or you're looking for the, the people to fulfill your vision, you want to go after an ace of spades, not a two of clubs. (laughs) <laughs> and so, uh, so Belton, what were some of the other lessons that you learned from, from your mentors that you have uh, been able to parlay into other organizations? Well, you know, as I said, the, the environment is first and foremost, creating the environment for success. When people, people, nobody wakes up in the morning wanting to do a bad job. Mm-hmm. Everybody wakes up in the morning wanting to have a wonderful day. You know, when you asked me at the beginning of our conversation, how was I today? And I tell people this all the time. I'm fantastic, but I'm not doing as well as you are. And that's, that's intentional. The intent there is to say to you that you are fantastic. And everything about you, in my view, is fantastic. So what I want to do is to create an environment, create a relationship that you feel comfortable having a conversation with. Me. That's first and foremost. Number two, when you have a vision, create the vision and then let the people around you fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. Talk to you about how you make this vision become a reality, what you need to do. Point number three is learn to speak positive words into the environment. Learn to say thank you and please. You'd be surprised how far those two words go. And sometimes when we get into the boss versus leadership role, because there is a distinct difference between Mm -hmm. a boss and a leader, we tend to gravitate when things get tense and intense to the boss role and not the leadership role. The leader is the person that says, thank you and please, and I appreciate you. The boss says, look, I need to get this done. I'm under a lot of pressure. I'm under deadlines. Dag on it. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Or dag on it, go versus let's go. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a there's a couple of things I want to come back to there. Uh, number one, I think it's what you said about you create the vision and then you let other people fill in the gaps. I think that's um, true even more so now because I think that that business has become so complex uh, that you can't be. You, you can't know everything, right? Not that you ever could know everything, but you absolutely can't now. And you need specialists to help you. So you have to create the vision and then you have to rely on people who have specialist skills, right? To be able to fill in those gaps and trust that they can. Well, you trust that you can. And one of the things that I learned also along the road, I, I'm a, an avid reader and I read a lot of books and I go back and read books two or three times. And in the last six months, I pulled out a book that I read back in the 90s. I'm dating myself for those people who may be a little bit my junior. It's <laughs> so, okay. We all, I remember the 90s well, well, kind of. Well, a gentleman named Tom Peters wrote a book called In mm-hmm. Search of Excellence. Right. Yeah, and yeah. one of the things that he talked about, and I'm writing this, I'm actually talking about it in the book that I'm writing called Leadership Dynamics, 52 Principles That Every Successful Leader Understands but it's called management by walking around Mm -hmm. and not walking around being a police officer, but walking around searching for people that are doing things that are exemplary outside the box that are challenging the status quo and making a big issue of it, making it, giving people accolades in public, Mm -hmm. making sure that everybody in the office, everybody in the operation hears, sees, and feels your excitement in what this person is doing. Now, conversely, if you run into a negative situation, you never talk about it in public. You pull a person in behind closed doors, you have a one-on-one counseling session, you set the stage for what the expectation is versus what you saw, and the conversation never goes into a public forum. What you do when you do that is you create an environment of energy in your office because, as I said before, 
Nobody wakes up in the morning wanting to have a bad day. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to be recognized for doing something great. And if you make it a habit of recognizing people for their positive contributions to your organization, it becomes contagious. Yeah, and I think that uh, again underlines what we were talking about is like rather than focusing on you know the one thing that you don't do well, the nine things that you do, that concept of like catching people doing something good and and celebrating it is uh, is something I don't think happens happens enough. Um, and you also said you know positive words, so it's interesting. There's a, there's a statistic in psychology today that sixty eight percent of our daily self talk is negative, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something to be said for watching what you're thinking and what you're saying and actually being cognitive of that and, and, and creating this, you know, using these positive words that you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Well, think about it this way, John. When you were working with people, and I, I, one of the philosophies that I adapted is nobody in my office works for me, everybody works with me. The mm -hmm. guy you have to work for, you don't want to know because I don't like it. <laughs> but if you're working with me, and if you're working with someone, how, many, how did you feel when they said, you know, John, I need your help on this. John, I need you to do me a favor. John, I need you to really stand with me and help bail me out of this one because I got a jam that I'm in. Can you, can you help me, please? Versus, you know what, John, I got a project I need you to handle, and I need you to handle it now because it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. How's that, how different is that? It's the same intention. But how does John feel about the second scenario versus how John felt about the first scenario. In the first scenario, you're sitting there going, okay, what is it? How can I help? How can I, how can I contribute? The second is, oh my God, here it comes again. You know, this guy's a Teflon manager. Everything slides off his desk going to mine. <laughs> Well, I tell you, uh, I tell you, Valton, I have a 14 year old son who uses that excuse all the time when he doesn't do something I asked him to do. He said, it's asked the way you asked me, dad. If you'd have asked me nicely, <laughs> I would have done it. And I'm like, no, you wouldn't have. <laughs> well, That's you why know, I'm not asking you nicely. John, you you got to manage that a little bit better, you said. So let me ask you this. The last time I, I yelled up the stairs to come eat with a stern tone, I should have been nicer about it? You would have been or what? Exactly. Well, I shouldn't have you at all and just let you come down when we were done. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Perfect. All right. Um, well, we're bumping up against the end of our time, Valton. But uh, before we go, I want you to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you and about uh, and when, will you, when will your new book be coming out? Um, right now, I'm actually halfway through and I'm, I'm looking for probably an August date. And I'm really excited about it because the book is designed to change your leadership style, but it doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Habits are not something that we formulate in an, in night, and it's based on the power of seven. If you do seven things, something seven times for seven straight days, it becomes a habit. So leadership dynamics is 52 principles. It takes you through an entire year of changing your attitude about leadership and how to better understand different aspects and concepts of leadership. And I draw from different experiences that I had personally, different stories from different people that I've worked with over the time, over the years. And I've even interviewed some of the people, the brightest people uh, that I've encountered in different industries from a leadership standpoint. So um, I'm really focused on three principles. And those of you who know me know the three principles that I, that my business is based on. One is sales. I spent 27 years in the hospitality industry uh, in sales and marketing, five years as a direct salesperson and 20 years as a leader, director of sales and marketing. So sales is in my blood. But from that 20 years in a leadership role, I learned the dynamics of leadership. I, I watched different leaders. I was a leader in different, under different circumstances. And I was fortunate enough to be mentored by some incredible leaders. And last but not least, what drives every business is the customer's experience. Mm -hmm. Understand this, customer service is a temporary situation. It is based on a transactional philosophy, but customer experience lasts a lifetime. Mm -hmm. That's why resorts like Atlantis, Disney, Universal Studios 
are in business and do very, very well. They create an experience that you want to enjoy again and again and your children and your children's children and children after that. So if you are truly leading a dynamic organization, you want to create a customer experience that locks you in as that individual, that families, that companies trusted advisor and they'll never make a move without you. Yeah, that's beautifully said, Velton, uh, uh, exactly, because I think that uh, you're right about customer service versus customer experience. And I think that's the one thing that people need to realize that a customer experience starts the moment you have any level of engagement before you're a customer, where you interact with that brand or service all the way through. And the experience has to be great all the way through. Mm -hmm. And it's not just something that you kind of flit in and flit out of. So beautifully said. All right, Felton. So uh, thanks again for your time today. And I hope I can say to you, I hope you're, you're feeling even better than I, uh, than I am now. <laughs> I'm always feeling great. And I'm, I look forward to everybody else around me feeling that much better. Because if you give en enough people what they want, you get more than you could ever handle. Excellent. Again, beautifully said. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Uh, thanks very much, Felton, for joining me today. I'll see you all for another Expert Insight interview very soon. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, John. Have a great evening. You too.